Okay, Amos chapter number 7. I'm going to be focusing in on the latter part of that chapter. In the beginning of the chapter, Amos is kind of speaking with God. God's showing him these things. And Amos is saying, you know, basically asking God not to do those things. And God's repenting and saying, okay, I won't do that. I won't do that. But he's basically bringing judgment upon Israel. Amos is in Israel, and he's, and he's preaching about... Now, when you read the earlier in the books of... In the, in the chapters of Amos, in the book of Amos, the earlier chapters, he's bringing a lot of negative news to, to a lot of the surrounding countries, to Moab, to Tyre and Sidon, to, to Judah, you know, to all these different places, and to Israel. And in chapter 7 here, we see that God's judgment is coming to Israel. And if we look here at um, verse number 10, the Bible reads, Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. So the priest, the priest at Bethel in Israel, is hearing God's word from Amos. Amos is preaching the truth from, from, from God about the destruction that's coming against Jeroboam because Jeroboam was the king of Israel at that time. Not Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. This is a different Jeroboam. He was the Jeroboam, the son of uh, Joram, I think. And he was the king in Israel. He was a wicked king. And God's going to bring his judgment at the time. And Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, if you remember, Bethel is what we were just reading about in Genesis, the place where um, Jacob went and he built an altar unto God and God spoke with him and everything else. This is that same Bethel. The priest sends to Jeroboam the king and says, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel and the land is not able to bear all his words. Like the people can't take this kind of preaching. He's preaching directly against you and he's saying, you know, that... that He's conspiring against you is what he says, as if, as if Amos has anything to do with the judgment actually coming against him. It's coming from God. It's not coming from Amos. Verse 11 says, For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread and prophesy there. So this priest comes up to Amos and he's saying, you know what? Don't preach that message here. We don't want to hear it. Nobody wants to hear your message. Why don't you just go and preach that in Judah? Um, and, you know, at this time, it's not like Judah and Israel were getting along together anyway. He's saying, you know, you, if you're going to be preaching these types of messages against the king, against Israel, why don't you go down to Judah and preach them? Verse 13, he says, but prophesy not again anymore at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. He's saying, well, this is the king's chapel. This is, this is the king's place. You can't be preaching against the king here. I love Amos's answer in verse number 14. Amos then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit. And the Lord took me as I followed the flock. And the Lord said unto me, Go, prophesy unto my people Israel. Now therefore hear thou the word of the Lord. Thou sayest, Prophesy not against Israel, and drop not thy word against the house of Isaac. Therefore thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city, and thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword, and thy land shall be divided by line, and thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. So Amos says, uh, look, I'm not a prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. This isn't my lineage. He's like, I was a herdman. I was out with my cattle. I was taking care of this herd and this flock. But God spoke to me. God called me. And he said, go prophesy unto my people Israel. And basically what he's saying is like, God told me to preach to Israel. Just because you're telling me to go preach in another land, go preach somewhere else, I need to listen to God. And, and he doubles down on, on the hard preaching against them. And he says, you know what? Because you're telling me not to preach against Israel, because you're telling me not to do what God told me to do, 
And you know what? There's going to be a lot of people out there telling you, don't preach that. Oh, don't preach that type of message. Oh, don't preach the negative message. You know, people might get offended and leave your church. Oh, don't preach that way. Look, if it's in the Bible, if it's God's word, we're going to preach that way. We're going to preach the message that God has for us to preach. He doubles down in verse 17. He says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Thy wife shall be an harlot in the city. Those are some pretty strong words. He's saying, you know what? Because you're telling me not to preach this here, because you're telling me you don't want to hear it, guess what's going to happen? Your wife is going to be a harlot. She's going to be a whore. And thy sons and thy daughters shall fall by the sword. Your, your children are going to die. You're going to be killed. And thy land shall be divided by line. You're going to lose everything. Your wife's going to be a whore. Your children are going to get killed. You're going to lose your property. He says, And thou shalt die in a polluted land, and Israel shall surely go into captivity forth of his land. So you guys are going to be defeated. You don't, want to, you don't want to hear the negative message. You don't want to hear this message. God's judgment is coming for sure. But what I want to preach on this morning, this is just kind of the, 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 the main point of, of chapter, or at least the latter part of chapter 7 that I'm covering here. But what we're going to look at is who is Amos? And, not, and more importantly, just it's not all about Amos because we're going to talk about other people. But we see here Amos is someone who's not afraid to offend. He's given, he's told what to preach by God and he does it. He doesn't let fear of other people dictate what he's going to say. He doesn't let man's wisdom dictate what he's going to say. He's interested in the truth. He's a simple man. He was a herdman. He's not this scholar. He's not this Bible expert. He was a herdman. But God spoke to him. God chose him and said, I have a job for you to do, Amos, and I want you to go and preach. And I want you to go and preach against Israel. And what did Amos do? He did that very thing. And oftentimes in the Bible, we see God choosing Regular men, ordinary men to do his work. And I don't think that pattern has changed. Now, there are many people here in the Bible that are prophets that were kind of born into this position, if you will. Maybe they were priests. They were, they were in this position and it's natural for them to be in the position of being a priest or a prophet. But there are many people that did not start off that way at all, yet God chose them to do this work. Amos is one of them. God called him and he obeyed. And the, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because you may be thinking today, well, who am I? Who am I? I'm not some important purple person. Purple. <laughs> I'm not some important person. I'm not a governor. I'm not a, you know, a, a politician. I don't, have, I don't sit in a position of power. I don't have this great influence over people. What in the world was God, would God want to do with me? And people have this false view of themselves where they think, well, who am I? Well, who was Amos? Amos was a herdman. Look, just because you may not have some really important job or be over a bunch of people, would you please take her out? Just because you may not have some very important job over a bunch of people, God can still use you. God can still call you to do many great things for His name. There's a lot of pastors today that I believe are very similar to the Pharisees. They have a Pharisaical attitude. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Bible tells us that the Pharisees, they loved to get the greetings in the marketplace. They loved to have the uppermost rooms at the feast. They loved the prestige that came with being a Pharisee, with being a doctor of the law, with being this well-studied, well-respected man that everybody can look up to as being so smart and being so righteous and being so holy, even though they were full of dead men's bones. The Bible says they looked good on the outside, but the inside was full of dead men's bones. But this is what they liked. They liked making the prayers in, in these long orations so that people could just hear how great at words they were and these great, these great prayers they were able to make. You know, and today we have the, the pastors that they want to make sure you call them doctor. You know, they're not just a regular person. They're, you know, they're doctor. You know, and I, went, I went to Bible college and I studied. I got, I'm a doctor. Call me doctor. And they have their clique of their Bible college friends. And um, 
you would never see these guys respond the way that Amos did. These people who are full of themselves, full of their pride, full of their knowledge. Now look, I think a pastor ought to be smart and educated and learned and well-learned and well-versed in the Bible and understand the Bible, but there's a difference between having that knowledge and teaching and preaching versus holding that knowledge over people and expecting people to just believe what you say because you've got some letters after your name. Today's wisdom that people will try to teach pastors is to say, well, you don't have to be so harsh or you don't have to say things like that. Look, Amos said your wife is, uh, is going to be a harlot. You don't get any more blunt than that. You don't get any more mean than that. Saying, you know what? Your wife's going to be a harlot and your kids are going to die and you're going to lose your land and you're going to go into captivity and you're going to die in a desolate land. But it's what needed to be said. There's no nice way of saying that. And there's truths in the Bible. And with the way that this world is going, especially this twisted nation that we live in today, with the homosexual agenda being advanced and people just taking it and accepting it and saying everything's just fine, judgment is coming in this nation. And it's not a pleasant thing to think about. But it's all the more reason why you need to stand up and fight against this and, and not be silent. The silent majority that, that I keep hearing about needs to stop being silent and speak up. But this sermon isn't about even criticizing other pastors or, or, or telling why everyone else has got things wrong. What I want this sermon this evening to be about is you. I want you to think about who you are. Who do you think you are in God's eyes? Turn, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to see more examples of men that were used of God in the Bible that weren't brought up in the, in the nobility, that didn't get all of the, the chances and all the, the head start and everything that you might think that you need in order to serve God appropriately. Look at 1 Kings 19, verse 15. The Bible reads, And the Lord said unto him, Go, return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mahola shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. So we see here that Elisha is being anointed to be the next prophet from Elijah. And then verse number 19, skip down to verse 19, says, So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. So here we see Elisha's just out in the field, and he's working with the oxen. He's got a yoke of oxen, he's got all these... All these oxen out there trying to plow the land and he's actually in there doing the work with these animals. He's trying to help plow. This is the man, he's a hard worker. But he's just doing a regular laborer type of job. He's not in the school of the prophets. He's over here working the land. It says in verse 20, and he left the oxen after, after you know, Eli Elijah's throws his mantle to him. He throws him and shoes. He's like, you know, passing off the mantle to him to be the next prophet. Verse 20 says, And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. And what I like about this is that when, when Elisha was called, he's really, you know, Elijah was the one that's like calling him, but he's calling him in the name of the Lord. It was God that was calling Elisha to be the next prophet. God's the one that told Elijah who was going to be the next prophet, who he was to anoint. So the, the, the anointing was coming from the Lord, even though it was Elijah physically that was there. Elisha answers God's call. 
And what does he do? He completely forsakes what he was doing. He says, you know what? I'm just going to say goodbye to my parents. I'm going to, you know, he killed the oxen that he was using as his job, as, a, as plowing. And he says, I'm not doing this anymore. It's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to follow the Lord and I'm called to be, to be his, his, uh, his prophet. And he accepts that calling wholeheartedly. No turning back. He doesn't turn back on what he's been called to do. He says, well, I'm going to burn my bridges right now. And he, he, he kills the oxen. And he uses the instruments that he was using to plow. He uses that as his kindling, as his wood, to burn up their meat and to make the food. Think about the apostles. Peter, James, and John were all fishermen. They were your average blue-collar worker. They weren't scribes. They weren't, you know, these, these Pharisees. They weren't, they weren't involved in that at all. Yet Jesus chose them specifically to be his apostles, to be his prophets, to be the people that he had a job to do. Jesus just said, follow me. You remember in those stories, he goes, follow me. And they forsook their nets. They gave up their jobs. They quit what they were doing and hearkened unto that calling. They listened to that call and they said, you know what? This is important. We're going to follow Jesus. This is what we need to do with our lives. Look who all of these people were. I mean, think about Moses. When Moses was called, when Moses you know, found the burning bush, he was already had fled Egypt because he had commit murder. He was a fugitive from Egypt. He had killed a man. Yet he still was chosen by God to do a great work for him. And what a great work he did. Think about being chosen for that job. I mean, Moses is one of the greatest men in the, in the Bible. When you talk about all the things that he did when he followed the Lord and all the miracles that were performed by his hands and, and you know, by the power of God through his hands and everything else that he did. Moses had an amazing job, but who was he? He started off as a, as a baby being put into a basket and put into the river because his parents didn't want to kill him as was the decree that they were supposed to kill him because he was a male. They didn't want to kill him, but they couldn't, they couldn't keep raising him because of the law. So they, they just by chance were going to give him up and he was basically, basically he was orphaned and was brought up in Pharaoh's household. Humble beginnings. Now, you know, he had, a, he had a, that, that specific upbringing. But who was he? He was, a, he was an orphan child that did these great things. Turn, if you would, to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We see the same thing with Gideon. It's this pattern that God likes to use people, ultimately, that are meek, that are lowly. People who are not full of pride. People who are not full of themselves. The Bible says, Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. God does not want to use these, these people who just get so puffed up in their, in their own education. He wants someone who's humble. Look at Judges chapter 6, verse 14. The Bible reads, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he's talking to Gideon. Verse 15, And he said unto him, O my Lord, Wherewith shall I save Israel? He's saying, how am I going to save Israel, God? Who am I? He says, behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. We're, just, we're poor. We don't have anything. And I am the least in my father's house. He said, I'm not highly esteemed. I am the least in my whole father's house. We're poor. And the Lord said unto him, verse 16, Surely I will be with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And that's the key right there for doing something great for God. We need to be able to be listening to answer God's call. Don't be so worried about who am I? Well, who am I, God? You know, I don't, I don't have this great education. I wasn't brought up in a Christian household. I don't know all this stuff, God. But who am I? How can I do this for you? Well, you need to be able to be willing to listen to God's call, to answer God's call, and just say and understand, look, if God's calling you to do something, He will be with you. He'll be with you. 
When we read in the Bible all these different things that we need to be doing with our life, the way that we're supposed to behave and the way we're supposed to act and the way we're supposed to treat other people and the way that we're supposed to, to manage our own lives and the things we're supposed to do, the things we're not supposed to do, the souls we're supposed to reach. Don't get caught up with who you are or maybe what you've done in the past or where your family comes from or what your background is. If you're being called by God to do something, know that God is with you. And that is what truly matters the most. If God be with you, with us, who could be against us? I love seeing all of these stories of these, of these great men in the Bible where we get to see a glimpse into their history. We get to see who they were. In the past tense, a herdman, the least of their father's house. Even, even Saul, King Saul, now he ended up doing bad later in life, but he was, he was you know, of the tribe of Benjamin, the smallest tribes, and, and, and he was real humble and meek and, and shy, and he hid himself, and, but he was chosen to be the king over the whole country because he was little in his own eyes. And I love seeing these people, who they were, where they came from, and then we get to see who they became. Who did they turn into? Who did they become? By heeding God's call. By listening to what God had to say for them and what God had for them to do with their lives. I believe God's calling a lot of people. But you don't read about them, you don't hear about them because they're, not everyone's answering that call. People get hung up on all kinds of things. Maybe they're thinking, well, I'm just a herdman. They don't want to do it. But the difference is, you know, regardless of your background, when you say, I'm going to do it. I'm going to listen to God. I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to do whatever it is God has for me to do because I know that God will be with me. That's when you bec can become somebody else. I was preaching about this this morning. The changes that God made in my life by being with me. And, and literally making me into another man. Because I answered his call in my life. I could never have thought, and look, it wasn't just one time thing. It's a, it, was a, it was a continuation of answering his call when you see in the Bible that you need to be preaching the gospel. Well, you just need to do it. It doesn't matter who you were. Well, I was the shy guy. I didn't like talking to anyone. I didn't like doing any of these things. You know, I was nervous. I was scared to death of it. It doesn't matter. That's who I was. And over time, God strengthened me to change me to do the things that were right because that's what He was calling me to do. And it wasn't just me. Look, I'm in a position of a pastor right now, but there are every single one of us is called to go out and win souls to Christ. Every single one of us has that job. Everybody does. We need to answer that call. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Everything is new. Look, you're a new creature. Act like it. Be, you know, live up to be the person that God created you to be. Not the fleshly man. The spiritual man. Live up to what God has had planned for you. Turn, if you would, to Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. If you want to serve God, don't get caught up in who you were. Maybe you've been saved for a while, but you really haven't been walking in the new man, in that new creation. You need to change that. You need to, to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Put, the, put that old man away. Girl, stop it right now. You need to walk in the new man. Are you in Ezekiel chapter 22? Ezekiel chapter number 22. Look at verse number 24. The Bible reads, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor rained upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. 
They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am pro profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath. Their own way have I recompensed upon their heads, saith the Lord God. In Ezekiel here, we're seeing these really bleak times. We're seeing the conspiracy of the prophets in the midst of that are prophesying lies, that are prophesying deceit, that they're saying from, hey, God said this or God said that, and they're lying. It says they have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst of. We see these, hor these, these bleak times. And we see all of the wolves and all of the bad people in charge. It says the princes in the midst of are like wolves. These people in charge, these people ruling the country, they're wolves. They're destroying people. They're being wicked. They're getting dishonest gain. And he's saying, look, I was looking up and down. I was trying to find a man to stand in the gap and I found none. I was looking for somebody to just stand up to this and to make these, these wrongs right and be willing to resist and fight the oppression. And I found none. Because I found nobody. Therefore, have I poured out my indignation upon them. Look, God wants to spare people. He has this great mercy and long suffering, but he needs somebody to stand up. Somebody needs to answer his call. Our country is going to hell in a handbasket because of all the wickedness and the princes and the people in power that are pushing this stuff down our throats. Somebody needs to stand up. Somebody needs to answer the call of God. There are a few people doing it. We need more. Are you willing to answer God's call? Turn, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, verse number 8 reads, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. We see Isaiah answering God's call, saying, Look, I'll do it. I'll be the messenger. I'll bring your word. I'll preach the truth. I'll say what's right. Here am I, Lord. Send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. We need more people like Isaiah to say, Look, God, I'm here. I'm willing. I want to do what it is that you have for me to do. God, send me. I'll preach the truth. There is a dearth in our land today of people who are not willing, you know, of people who are willing to, to, to tell the truth, to preach all of God's word, to preach the Holy Bible, to preach the negative message today that needs to be preached because of the coming judgment that's coming upon our land. So many people want to take the wickedness and try to just make it okay and try to say, oh, well, yeah, it's a sin, but you know, we got to love them anyways and love, 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 and everything's just love. No, we need to hate this sin. We need to get it out of here. We need to change the path of this country. We need to change the minds of the people. And the only way you could do that is by preaching the power through God's word. You need to go out and get people saved and get the spirit of the holy God inside of them and get them to... to not accept what the world is trying to push on us. But we need more people. 
Don't worry about your background. Who am I? God is looking for more messengers today. God wants more people to send. You have to ask, this is a real short sermon tonight, but you have to ask yourself, am I willing to listen? Am I, am I even listening? Am I listening to what God has for me? Are your ears open to God's calling? You're not going to hear something audibly, but are you getting in this book? Are you treating this with the, with the amount of importance that it ought to have in your life? Seriously, think about that. Are you spending enough time in your Bible? Are you reading God's Word? Are you really listening? And when you read it, are you just, are you just doing it because you just absolutely have to? Or are you intently listening to what God has to teach you? His words, His wisdom, it's not a chore. It's His words. It's life. It's light. It's truth. You should hang on every word of the Bible and love it and try to see what it is that you can learn and you can do better in your life. How in the world are you going to know if God's calling if you're not even listening? How can you answer that call? Learn His word. Study it. Listen to it. Read it. And obey it. You think, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. God sought for one man in Ezekiel. He sought for one person to avoid the destruction that came. He was looking for one person. Well, what could one person do? One person can stay off the destruction of God. But he said, oh, I couldn't find him. Nobody was listening. Everybody was too busy doing whatever it is that they want to do with their life. Worried about their house and their car and their dogs and their job and everything else. Too busy to care about what God had for them. Nobody wanted to make the sacrifice. If there is to be any hope for our children, more people need to be listening. And when you hear it, respond and offer yourself up a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. Say, God, I want to serve you. Matthew 12, verse 30 says, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Which are you? Are you a gatherer? Or are you a scatterer? You can't be in the middle. You can't be, well, I'm neither. If you are not actively gathering, you are scattering. Not a positive sermon tonight, but it can be. It's, it's designed to hopefully help you to, to think about what you're doing for Christ. How much are you reading your Bible? How much are you listening to what God has for you to do? And are you willing to, to are you just willing to do what God has for you? Can you take that and accept it by faith and just be willing to say, I will, I will serve you, Lord? Whatever that means, I'll serve you. You need to have a humble heart. That's who God chooses to do His work. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You so much for the Bible. We thank You for the great men that we get to learn from. We thank You for seeing the Isaiahs and Ezekiels and and. Lord, these different men who have chosen and willfully accepted the, the, your will for their life and accepted the jobs and the tasks that you had set out for them, dear Lord, because they were listening. And they love you and they wanted to do whatever it is you had for them to do, God. I pray that you would please just help instill that spirit in us, that we would be excited to serve you, that we would be saying, 
pick me, Lord, pick me. I want to go and do it. I want to go and do what you have for us to do instead of being like the people who just turn their heads the other way and just saying, well, I hope he doesn't pick me. We should have the right attitude and the right heart to want to serve you and want to do what's right, dear God. Lord, I, I worry for our children. I worry for this next generation. And I know that what's already been sown needs to be reaped. But I pray that you can use us and just stir up the souls of that much the more people, dear God, to want to do what's right, to want to serve you, to answer your call, dear God, and that we can push back, push back for righteousness, push back against the, the, the wickedness of this world, dear God. Help us to, to bring back some sense of normalcy and, and, and goodness, dear Lord, and, and just righteousness. We live in this upside-down, bizarre, strange world, dear God, where so many people now have just fully embraced wickedness. Lord, speak to our hearts. Soften us up. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.